Mike Tyson, Mark Hunt, Conor McGregor, Dan Henderson, Francis Ngannou. In the world of MMA and boxing, there are few things as intimidating and polarizing as a true power puncher. The fighter that holds the touch of death, that seemingly inhuman ability to put down their opponent with just a single punch. As prolific power puncher Deontay Wilder says, They have to be perfect. I don't, for 12 rounds, I don't have to be perfect for two seconds. And each and every time I prove that. But what is it that gives these fighters this power? Is it something that you're born with? Something that can be learned and cultivated with training? Or a mixture of genetics and training to create a killer? In this video, we will go over a variety of factors that can contribute to a fighter's ability to generate power in their hands. The biggest question that has surrounded the topic of power punching is whether or not the power is genetic and something a fighter is born with. Fighters like Mike Tyson, Deontay Wilder, Francis Ngannou, and Mark Hunt claim that they were born with this God-given power. The short answer is yes. Kind of. But the long answer is a bit more complicated. If a fighter's power is genetic, what specifically are the factors that provide power? Well, there are quite a few factors that are believed to enhance a person's power, some with more scientific evidence than others. One of the most widely recognized identifiers of power is wrist and hand size and circumference. The reason these are common measurements for power is that there is a direct correlation between wrist and hand size and the size of a person's bones and frame. Larger bone size and skeletal frame means more power for a few reasons. Hands and wrists also don't tend to hold large amounts of fat like other parts of the body, so are viable measurements for almost any body fat level. Larger hands and bones means more mass in your arms as a whole. Since power is a function of mass and velocity, increasing the mass of the arm will add significant power without negatively affecting speed. A great example of this is boxer Manny Pacquiao, who has 39 career knockouts at the time of this video. He boasts a wrist size of 8 inches around at 145 pounds and 5 foot 6 in height, which is higher than the average wrist size for heavyweight boxers. Heavyweight greats like Mike Tyson and Joe Lewis also had wrist sizes of 8 inches. MMA fighter Francis Ngannou has the largest hand size of any active fighter, maxing out at the limit with a triple XL glove. A larger frame also means the upper limit of how much muscle the skeleton can naturally hold is higher. This can be seen in fighters like Ngannou who is 6 foot 4, 255 pounds and has a 6 pack or Mike Tyson, who at 5'10", weighed nearly 220 pounds with very little body fat and a non-existent neck. Building off of skeletal structure, another big genetic factor that affects power are the insertions of ligaments and tendons onto the frame. For this, we will use the pectorals, biceps, and triceps as examples. There are many more muscle groups that play important roles in generating power, but we will focus on these as they are the ones that directly propel the arm. These muscles all have two insertion points on the skeleton. Using the pectoral as an example, we can see that the muscle originates on the sternum and inserts on the upper part of the humerus. This muscle acts by pulling the arm forward through flexion of the humerus when it contracts, similar to throwing a punch or bench pressing. Where the aspect of power comes into the equation is when we examine where the pectoral inserts on the humerus. If we had two people with pectorals with the exact same size, strength, and muscle fibers, but one had the muscle insertion lower on the humerus than the other, the person with the lower insertion would be able to generate more power. The easiest way to understand why that is, is to think of the arm as a lever, specifically a third class lever, force that can be generated. In the case of a punch, more leverage or more force means a faster, meaner punch being thrown. The same logic applies for both biceps and the triceps which are also the key muscle groups in propelling the arm for a punch. Unfortunately, this is a difficult metric to quantify and analyze on a fighter. Other metrics such as muscle tendon elasticity and dominant muscle fiber types will also play a role in this. Tendons which have a higher elastic modulus can store a larger amount of energy within them given the same level of deformation or flexing. This study shows a strong correlation between muscle tendon parameters like the ones mentioned and peak power generated. A metric that is much more easily quantifiable is the standing vertical jump, something most of us are familiar with from high school gym class. Although it has not yet been directly linked to punching power, it is a long-standing staple of measuring an athlete's ability to generate power in American football, Olympic lifting, and wrestling. 
legendary strength coach and author Mark Ripito writes extensively about the standing vertical jump in his book Practical Programming for Strength Training. The reason the vertical jump is a strong metric for power is that it can measure how much of an athlete's strength they can convert into power. It also cannot be trained. An already fit athlete who trains on their vertical jump for years and years may only increase their jump by about 2 inches, aside from losing large amounts of weight as it's something that's determined by genetics. This study from the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research found a strong correlation between vertical jump scores and peak power generated by weightlifting athletes. Here's a chart of standing vertical jump scores. How much power can you generate? One of the last factors I want to cover is musculature. Although many assume that big guns and pecs means you must be a hard hitter, that is not necessarily true. When assessing an athlete's power capabilities, it's better to assess the legs, glutes, and the back. Like Conor McGregor's coach John Kavanaugh says, first thing I check on a fighter is their ass. After all, a good punch comes from the legs and hips. If you don't believe me, look at the legs of Mike Tyson. After watching this video, you might be feeling disappointed. You measured your wrist, checked your high jump score, checked your ass in the mirror, and realized that you just may not have the genetic jackpot to knock out a horse. But don't let that discourage you from trying to learn to hit hard. More important than any of the factors mentioned earlier, years of dedicated training, honing your skills, hand speed, precision, and timing can allow an athlete with the most average genetics to develop reliable knockout power. Thanks for watching our video. If you liked our content, make sure to like, comment, and power punch that subscribe button.